You and I share an interest in the roles of women in leadership and global governance. And there's a very interesting situation now with women serving uh, in the posts of both executive director and deputy executive director at UNEP, as well as a number of women leading some of the environmental convention secretariats. Uh, and while Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, has made greater gender parity in the UN senior management posts his top priority, I wonder if you have any explanation for this, un what seems like an unusual concentration uh, of women in official leadership positions in UNEP. This is, it's a very important issue indeed. A lot more studies uh, in the business uh, realm now show that collective intelligence rises with the number of women in a group. The more women you have, the greater the collective intelligence of that group. And that in engaging a critical mass of women is linked to more and more progressive and positive outcomes and to more sustainability focused decision making across various sectors. And so we see that movement in the United Nations. You're absolutely right. And your article in, in this issue points to the numbers. We see an upward trajectory. And UNEP has made significant strides on gender parity, significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the overall staff uh, of UNEP is 1,242 staff. 60% are professional staff and 40% are general service staff. Among the professional staff, 53% are women. 53%. So it is not only at that directorship level that you mentioned, but it is also within the professional staff. Uh, and so your article talks about glass ceilings and the uh, glass walls in the environmental field some of them are being shattered indeed we but as we gather more and more data we will have more levers to reshape hiring and promotion but you also note in in your piece for example that broader question of what difference does it have to have more women uh in those place in in these uh positions uh what difference does having more women make um and here Perhaps the story of Christiana Figueres is, uh, is the most telling one <laughs> that uh, I would like to share with you and, and the, the listeners and, and the viewers. So if we, if we think about climate change, which is the existential crisis of our time, mm -hmm. I have uh, had the, the privilege to, to go to many of the conferences of the parties and uh, I remember very well the one in Copenhagen in 2009, COP15, that was deemed by all a failed um, COP. Um, after that, in 2010, Christiana Figueres took on the leadership position of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. She became the executive secretary. And so, no one thought that significant change was possible. The mood after Copenhagen was dark, it was dire, and there was very little appetite for any serious collective action. But I would dare say that it was Christiana Figueres's contribution to the climate movement that we got out of that hurdle and that we managed to uh, attain the Paris Agreement five years later in 2015. And how did she do that? And being a woman there is no small part of that, of, of that accomplishment. Because Christiana Figueres changed the narrative from one of sacrifice to one of opportunity. And she moved from the tactic of name and shame that we hear about so often in policy studies to name and acclaim. She created a strategy that a lot of women use successfully, that is focusing on what unites, not on what divides, and then progress becomes much more attainable. 
And so Christiana, rather than focusing inward and limiting the number of negotiators and the number of parties, she actually opened things up and allowed citizens, civil society, to engage and to come in with their own commitments, with their own contributions, and be counted not only as someone that demands action, but also as someone that commits to action. And uh, so just before the Paris conference in 2015, I wrote an op-ed piece of why more women need seats at the table, at the climate table, and CNN picked it up. The Boston Globe picked it up. It, it, I, was, I was really surprised by the attention that such a piece could get. Um, and then Vogue also ran a piece about the 13 climate warriors in 2015. I had, uh, I had showcased 15. Then Time Magazine in 2019 also ran a story about 15 women leading the fight against climate change. And so some of these women have appeared in many of the articles that we talk about, but many women are, have not, they're new. And so these stories inspire and they empower a new generation of, of women. And so I have, I have actually great faith that through these generational um, narratives, we could inspire a lot more women. And we see that happening. 